episode 24 of the podcast. In the first part, we're going to talk about fears. We're going to talk about being startled, spooked, and scared. And then the second part, we're going to talk a little bit about whether or not we need a training plan. And then we're going to talk some safety. This is the Creating Great Grooming Dogs podcast. I'm Chrissy Newmeyer-Smith. I'm a certified professional groomer, a certified behavior consultant for canines, and a certified professional dog trainer. And this, my friends and colleagues, is the podcast where grooming and training meet. I want to talk today about a little bit about fears. Now, we did cover fears um, back in episode three. So if you want to circle on back, that'd be awesome. But let's talk some more about fears. And I'm going to start off with a couple of human examples, stuff from my own life. Um, so <laughs> things that um, were quick and startling, okay? I want you to think about um, the fact that sometimes a fear is something that appears because of one particular experience. It might be something you've done or it's, you do even multiple times a day without anything going wrong. But then one day something happened and now you have to figure out how to get over it. So let me give you an example. Um, I was about eight years old and I went to put on my shoes and put on one of my shoes and it was fine, put on the other one and there was something in it. Like I heard a sound and I felt something against my toes and I knocked out my shoe and it was a, a bee, an angry bee. I didn't even get stung, but an eight-year-old finding an angry bee in their shoe, <laughs> like I was pretty freaked out. Oh my God. Oh my God. It's going to sting me. Like, you know, mom, you know, uh, <laughs> and for the longest time, I checked my shoes before I put them on. I kind of tipped them over and give him a knock, make sure there's nothing in the toe hiding and it'll fall into the heel. And I did it for a very long time. Kind of a superstitious behavior. Um, but, you know, you think about, all right, well, it seems reasonable and harmless that if I'm worried about something now, I would do something to prepare myself for what I'm worried about. Okay. And that's kind of what we're thinking about with like a fear of, of something that You've been doing for a long time. I mean, at eight, year old, eight years old, how many times have you put on your shoes over and over and over again? And in the summertime, you know, like that's probably every time you came in the house, you took them off and had to put them on every time you went back outside. It's a lot of shoes, right? But it still affected me and just kind of got me a little bit scared, right? So I'm going to give you another example, something you do all the time. But this one particular incident, this one particular moment was enough to just like really change the way you look at something. Okay. So I, um, I had some of those shampoo bottles that are all, like the tube. Um, I'm sure you know the ones that look almost like a tube of toothpaste, but the, they're shampoo and conditioner. Never, ever, ever had a problem with those. Had those for a long time. Use those pretty often until one day, um, I dropped one in the shower and the edge of that tube ripped my foot open. So I had this big bleeding um, wound on my foot. I mean, it wasn't something you need stitches for or anything, but man, that's uncomfortable in your shoes for a long time. So for the longest time, if I had shampoo with that type of bottle design, I was super, super careful about putting them back really carefully and making sure for a while, even I was putting them on the edge of the tub on, on the, on the outside of the edge of the tub. Like, okay, I'll, I'll just reach out and pick them up when I need them. They're not going to be on the shower wall anymore. You know, talk about paranoid, but something that you do all the time, but once, just once it hurt you or once, just once it scared you. So when you think about those as something relatable, I want you to think about maybe there was a time in your life that, you know, something you're used to doing and it startled you or scared you. Um, another example is, I don't know if you've ever been like driving home from work or back home or something like that, where suddenly there's something in the road an animal darts out or you hit a deer or something happens. And for the next time you're driving down the road at about the same time, you're like, your head's on a swivel. You are looking all around. You're like, oh my God, what's going to happen? What's going to happen? For some of us, we bounce back from things very quickly. For others of us, those fears can take hold. And when we're talking about the dogs in our care, I want you to think about they're all individuals and some of them are going to be like, oh, that startled me. Oh, no biggie. 
and they don't need a whole lot of coaching. And then other dogs, other animals are going to be like, oh, that startled me. Oh my God, I'm so freaking scared. I'm so scared and I'm going to be scared for a long, long time Um, (laughs) and need a lot more help getting past something that's scary. So when we look at those kind of fears, I also want you to be thinking that um, fear is a chemical response in your body. So once something scares you, you don't really have a lot of control on how your body responds to it. There are hormones that just go through your system. Um, not to play vet. I'm not, I, I should actually get a t-shirt that says not to play vet. But, um, <laughs> but if you think about things like um, adrenaline, um, we, we know what an adrenaline rush is. And actually, I know that's not the proper term anymore, but, you know, epinephrine and norepinephrine, but that adrenaline rush or the, the feeling you get when you are scared where suddenly your heart's beating faster and you're breathing heavier and you're very, very super alert or scream or whatever it is, um, that's your body taking over. Like something startled you, but just being startled isn't what makes you breathe heavier and have your heartbeat go up. That's your body's reaction to being startled. And you don't have a whole lot of control over it. And that response can last for a short time or then hours or even days. So it really depends on the individual and the individual situation. Now, um, the example of the, the bee in my shoe right? It startled me. And I'm not, I'm not a fearful person. So the startle was the, oh my God, you know? And then I calmed down pretty well, right? I mean, by the time I said, mom, I was already like, oh, okay, it was just a bee, you know? (laughs) I'm not the type to be really afraid. But, um, but it still left a mark because now I'm thinking, well, what can I reasonably do to prepare myself for putting on shoes, right? Or what can I reasonably do to prepare myself for stepping into the shower with a shampoo bottle that could cut my foot, (laughs) which has never happened before or since (gasps) happened only once. Not a big deal. But I want you to think about the when your body takes over for someone like me having, you know, the ability to rationally say, okay, it's never happened before. And really, it's not very likely. Like, how often do shampoo bottles rip someone's foot open? Not very often, (laughs) right? I can rationalize that. But our dogs, we don't really know where they're coming from, right? I can't get into their head and ask them, um, you know, hey, how do you feel about nail trimming? But if they had one time where it either startled them or scared them, not even necessarily hurt them. Like, the bee didn't hurt me. It was in my shoe, but it didn't hurt. It's not even necessarily if it hurt, but if we do something that scares them or startles them, they can have this long-term memory of, oh God, that's those are the nail trimmers. Okay, how do I prepare myself so that that doesn't happen again, right? Um, how, can I, how can I do something to make that not happen? Now think about it from an animal's point of view. If there's something you don't want to happen, what do you do? You try to escape or you try to make somebody back off. Usually we see those as fear or aggression, right? <laughs> but, um, but if we want to get over that, we need somebody to kind of come back and help us calm down, right? So again, the eight-year-old girl with the bee in her shoe, if it were another little kid, um, that might be, hey, all right, calm down. Let me help you with this, right? You're thinking now from an adult point of view, an eight-year-old who's really afraid, and maybe that turns into the adult checking the shoes. Look, I already took a look. Look at that. Yep, there's no bee in this shoe. Left shoe's fine. Here comes the right one. Okay, the right shoe's fine also, right? To help take charge of the situation. Now, in a grooming setting, I want you to think about how we're in charge of the situation, Um, you know, no matter what else is going on, even though I'm in customers' homes, because I'm a house call groomer, and even though I'm working directly with their owners, what happens on my table is my responsibility. And because of that, I am in charge of what happens on my table. It has to go through my, my moral filter, (laughs) you know, but if I have a dog that I think has got a little bit of fear around something, I want you to think about the ways that we kind of say, all right, I'm going to calm you down and show you, hey, these are nail clippers. Can you be calm while I just show them to you? That's the same as the parent saying, okay, I checked this shoe for a B. You comfortable putting it on now? Okay, I checked this one too. Are you comfortable putting it on? You know, and you might find that 
taking the time to say, hey, these are nail trimmers. Are you ready? Can you lift up this foot? Can you hold it for me? And we've talked about that before, naming things for dogs and talking to them about what we're doing, because I think that's really important. They catch on and they really begin to listen to those key pieces. Like, okay, are you ready? You know, and then if you snip a nail and nothing happens, right? Think about how many repetitions you need to build good experiences before that old experience just goes by the wayside. Um, certainly, I don't check my shoes for bees every day. <laughs> I mean, it's been almost 40 years. So, you know, <laughs> but uh, but if you think about it, there if I were really scared, that could have been something I did for years. I think it was just a summer, but it was a long time. It was a lot of checking shoes, even though that one event didn't even hurt. So if you think about the lasting impression, we can change that lasting impression by making this more relaxed, by being, being able to kind of say, all right, I want you, little puppy, little dog, to be as calm as you can so that I can show you that this is safe and help you feel safe again and to build a number of repetitions of how safe. Now, in a grooming setting, I want you to think about it's not just like, oh, we did his nails today. So that's one repetition of being safe. If you have that dog for a full grooming, you have a number of different ways to circle back and do another nail and cir or circle back and do another paw. If you do each paw separately and then go back to some other stage, like, okay, I do one paw and then I'm going to go back to an ear and then I'm going to do another paw and I'm going to go back to your tail. And then you can get four repetitions of nail trimming. If you're doing each nail, right, you can get about 16 repetitions of nail trimming in one grooming session to make a whole bunch of new memories that are completely different than the thing that scared them or spooked them, right? Because it's not always about this terrible, terrible thing that happened, you know? Um, it's not even necessarily if the nail got quicked. Sometimes it's just a matter of, I wasn't expecting it, which is another reason why I try to encourage groomers to talk to your dog, talk to the dogs, tell them what you're doing so that we're not saying, oh, he's being so good. I'm just going to quick snip. See, it's okay. It's okay. It's okay. It's okay. Because we know, or at least trainers know, that's not going to calm a dog down. And if it got them scared, that chemical process is happening. Their heart rate's increased. Their muscles have better blood flow. They're ready to jump away or do things to make you want to leave them alone, right? To repel you or to leave. And in a grooming setting, they are secured. They're on a grooming arm with a grooming loop or in a tub with a grooming loop on them. They don't really have the opportunity to go away. So they're far more likely to choose to try to repel you, to put on a big show and make you back off, which could be teeth and hackles and, you know, like to, to really be upset. <laughs> And for us all to find it very upsetting, right? But I want you to think about um, calming them down before you even try the thing that used to make them scared, right? So back to the little kid with the bee in the shoe, right? If someone said, don't be ridiculous, just put your shoes on, put them on, right? You know, like That's not going to be helpful. That's a little kid who's going to be like, I just need to, don't check your shoe, just jam it on. Ah, you know, I mean, that's just going to build and build right? That's going to continue to be a problem. And sometimes that's what we've been doing in grooming. Like, well, let's just get his nails done. I mean, he didn't get quicked. I don't know what he's so worried about, but it's not because it hurt. It's because it was scary. So sometimes we have been doing the same thing over and over and over again and not seeing improvement because we didn't recognize that it was the scary part of it all that it was because it was scary, not necessarily because it hurts. Fear doesn't necessarily mean that there was pain. Fear means that they're worried about pain <laughs> and they're worried the pain could happen. Uh, so thinking about fears from a human point of view and try to come up with some of your own, something that, that really startled you and made you kind of change the way you worked around your own life for a little while. Like, okay, can I calm down from this? And then apply that to our dogs. If you're enjoying my podcast, please remember to subscribe so that you don't miss any episodes. At what point does a dog need some training? 
That's an interesting question, isn't it? So at what point would you say, oh, this dog we need to teach some more stuff for? And I think that um, trainers, we tend to make everything a training problem because training problems are what we do. That's how we view our world. We look at what a dog is doing and we come up with ways to help them learn how to do something different or, you know, like approach the fear, like how to adjust that. Groomers, we tend to think more like, well, let's bring you in, get you started, see how you do. And I think that there needs to be both. There needs to be a little bit from each of those professions. So on the one hand, I am all for like, hey, all right, well, new dog hasn't been groomed before. Come on, let's go see how it goes. Now, in my groomer mind, I'm thinking, okay, I'm going to, you know, slow things down a little bit and help that dog be comfortable. In my training mind, <laughs> I'm also thinking I'm looking for signs of stress and I'm willing to stop grooming if this dog can't handle it. Um, so that I'm thinking and I'm aware that, okay, what is this dog learning in this moment? Which I think groomers can be better at. Like, oh, all right, I see now that I do not need to get this completed. All right. When owners approach you and say, well, I don't really know how my dog is, you know, maybe it's a new to them dog. Maybe, you know, we get a lot of adult dogs coming in through rescue. So maybe they don't know. Um, but part of how we can prepare all of that is to be thinking in terms of it's a dog we don't know. Let's try to set it up to be as relaxing as possible. And let's be watching for signs that the dog is stressed, which we've talked about before, that not just like looking at their face, but when their body is si stiff, when they stiffen up against our hands, like that's a sign of stress. That's not a dog who's loose. That's not the three C's, comfortable, calm, and cooperative, right? Um, and to let owners know that we have a safety policy. And episode one, I talked about a safety policy, and I'm going to circle back here for that safety policy, because I think that... Um, as groomers, we tend to think, oh, I have to get this job done. And no, no. And when I'm looking at it from my training point of view, getting the job done, no matter what that dog's behavior is doing, means that we are likely to increase problems for future groomings. It's not necessarily even going to stay at the same level of problem. It might become worse. It often becomes worse. So trainers are looking at it as, oh, okay, I need to help this dog's brain right now. And I want groomers to be thinking about that a little bit more too. Now, trainers, I want you to be thinking, we don't necessarily start a training plan with a dog that we don't know has an issue or not. That most dogs really can get through it. Um, I think in trainers' minds, we see an awful lot of dogs with problems, and we start thinking that that's the norm. And you know what? In my experience, having done both, you know, and working with a, a different clientele, because groomers, we don't, we see a lot of the dogs that owners aren't interested in teaching. Trainers, we see an awful lot of dogs whose owners recognize that there's a problem. <laughs> and that's a different clientele and that's a different group of dogs um, so you see dogs with problems and owners who are willing to understand that there is a problem and are looking to make change um, groomers we see a lot more of the oh well I would never go near him while he's eating a bone of course he would bite us you know <laughs> things that most of us wouldn't dream of living with <laughs> but you know the average owner has a different point of view but the average dog when we get them into a grooming setting really just needs to be coached through it. They need a little bit of gentle handling, like, hey, buddy, come here. All right, well, let's get you used to it. Let's see how you do. Um, and most of them can handle it, right? The ones who can't handle it are, are a big problem, right? And, and not just for the groomer, but for their own safety and for their future, because their owners need to be able to help them in an emergency or give them medication. Their vet needs to be able to check them over. It's not just about grooming. Um, and as I've mentioned before, dogs that learn to be good for grooming can learn to be better for everybody else too, right? If we do it and we're mindful of it, like the dogs that I groom are better for their vet. The dogs that I groom are better for their owners if their owners are on board with trying to figure out how to do it. Not all of my owners are hands-on interested in that. 
<laughs> but they still have better success than they did before. You know, they might tell me like, oh, yeah, I put him in the tub and cleaned up his bum. I'm like, do you remember when you got him and he couldn't let he wouldn't let you do that? Like, oh, yeah, right. So when we look at um, the the various points of view, I want you to think that before we start saying I need to teach this dog about nail trimming, let's try a nail trim. We don't know yet if we have a problem. Right now, it's an unknown. And many, many, many dogs are fine for nail trims. Just taking it slow, relax. And, you know, for groomers, like I said, be thinking about, I, I need to let go of the idea of getting it done. Getting it done, no matter what his brain is doing, isn't a good long-term plan. It's not going to be helpful. So um, let me go by and tell you a little bit about my safety policy because it's been a little while and I kind of revise it all the time, but this is generally what I tell people. Um, and I do it all the time, so it's not something I've written down. I should write it down for you guys. But if at any time your dog gets nervous, anxious, scared, aggressive, or even like overly silly, we're going to slow down and help your pet to be calm. Because it's really important, and I usually don't say us, it's me, right? But it's really important to me that your pet um, is safe and stress-free. We're using sharp tools we need to prevent injuries. So we'll work with your pet to help them feel comfortable and build a great experience for successful grooming for a lifetime. That it, You want them to know this isn't about trying to refuse your pet. This is about a successful grooming experience that builds on more successful grooming experiences for a dog who is a steady eddy for their whole life right? Um, because grooming is what, once a month or once every two months for a lifetime, for let's say 15 years, right? That's a lot of repetitions. And it's a lot of time that's going to be covered. We want them to be comfortable with it. So part of that safety policy is telling people that, you know what, if your dog, you know, is having an issue, well, I'm going to slow it on down. And your dog might not have a perfect groom today. Your dog might not be fully completed. I will charge you for my time because, well, your, your grooming time already isn't allotted time. Like that's what your price is based on. We don't have a box of trims that we can just sell to you. If you do, by the way, please do tell me. If you can ship me two Border Collie trims, just let me know because I've got two Border Collies and, you know, I'd love a full groom if you can ship it to me and I can just open the box. Um, <laughs> wise guy. Knock it off, Chrissy. Um, but I want you to think about um, that our time is still going. We're still on the clock. So for groomers, I want you to let go of the idea that you have to get it finished or that you're going to lose money. When you explain it as a safety policy and remind the owners that we're using sharp tools, if it can cut hair, it can cut a dog. No, it doesn't matter if it's a ball tip shear or if we're using snap-on combs over, over a clipper blade because sometimes people think that those are safety things. A dog that tries to bite a clipper over a snap-on comb is likely to get injured. It's just going to happen, you know. A dog that tries to break free of our arms when they're, you know, being picked up is likely to fall and break a leg or hurt us or both. So when we talk to them about safety and that we're preventing injuries, we're preventing stress, and that this is for the dogs in our care, and, and to remind them that this is their dog is somebody we care about. And this is for their future, to make their lives easier as well as their dog's life easier. We're not doing it for free. <laughs> I mean, if I have a dog that I cannot complete and I decide to not continue with, then I adjust my pricing. Does that make sense? But if I spend a Cocker Spaniel amount of time on a Cocker Spaniel who doesn't get finished but learns a whole bunch, I'm charging for a Cocker Spaniel. Okay, um, and I'm not going to feel bad about it because I explained my safety policy ahead of time. If they don't agree with the safety policy and they don't agree with the idea of keeping their dog safe and helping their dog learn, I'm not their groomer. And that's OK. Um, unfortunately, there are still groomers out there who will take that dog no matter what. Um, and honestly, I wish more of us as an industry would say, oh, that's not safe. You know, I want them to hear it three or four times. Like, no, you just told me your dog's aggressive and you're not interested in teaching him. I'm not taking that on. Trainers don't take that on. 
an owner who calls me for training and says, oh, I don't plan on working with them at all. Um, to me, I have to explain to them, all right, but that means that all of the things that you've been doing, all of the habits that you guys have together are going to stay the same and you want only your dog to be different. Um, and that's not how life works. It's just not how it works. Um, so I'm not going to have great success with your dog or your dog would have great success with me until you come home. Right. If you want to yell at your dog for barking, the barking's not going to stop. So if we're aware of you need to be part of this process or choose not to, owners can choose not to, but they have a responsibility for their pet's care. So if they have trouble finding anybody to do it and everyone is telling them we have a solution Here's the solution, whether that be your vet or a vet behaviorist or a behavior consultant or a trainer or the groomer spending extra time or combinations of all of those. But we have a solution set to get your dog on the fast track to being really good for a lifetime of grooming and other types of handling for care and comfort and medical reasons, then we are setting them up for success. And if we can get doggy daycares and dog walkers and vet offices and everybody else to say, no, that seems reasonable to me. You know, when they come and say, they charged me full price and they didn't even get that hair around his lip because they said he was mean. You know, <laughs> like, you know I want a vet or, or any other dog professional to say, so was he trying to bite them while they were trimming his face? Because that seems pretty reasonable that they weren't able to get that. And that they still charged you because they're, they're charging for their time. This is some of the ways that we as professionals can all um, help each other and help those owners understand that they have um, a solution set. We're willing to find them the solution for their problem. We're willing to work with them. I don't fire dogs. I'll fire a customer, but not their dog. Um, so I want you to be thinking about that safety policy and having something that says, I'm not telling you that I'm going to get your dog 100% groomed, right? You have a standard poodle that's a year old that's never been groomed before. Maybe he'll let me do poodle feet. Maybe he won't. Maybe he'll learn about poodle feet and not get them completed today. But I'm not going to give you a discount um, unless I stopped and didn't spend time on it. Spending time on it is always, always, always something you charge for. And I think that that's fair. I think that's appropriate because we're giving a service. We're providing a service and not an item. So some things to think about. And um, everybody have a great week and stay curious. If you'd like to talk to me, you can find me through my grooming and training business, happycrittersdogtraining.com, my email, chrissy at happycritters.net, and through the Creating Great Grooming Dogs Facebook page. And we have these awesome devices in our pockets that allow us to do live video with each other. I can help you with the dog on your table. We can set up live lessons, and you may be surprised at how much we can get accomplished together via video. I'm also happy to come to you if you're near my area in southern New Hampshire.